Okay, yeah, so that makes me a shrink in case people were uh, a little confused, like private practice in what, doctor of what. So yeah, if there is a medical emergency, not your gal. Um, but <laughs> I was about to joke, I had this Kleenex box sitting up here a minute ago, and we decided I probably didn't need it. But I was like, oh, look at you all, I'm trying to make me feel comfortable. <laughs> um, <laughs> job security for Kleenex, that's psychologists. Um, so today, I, I'm really pleased, I honestly am really honored to be able to come and speak, and especially um, to reference the Stonewall Movement. That's something I've already referenced in trainings and speaking engagements, and um, the fact that we're at a 50-year sort of anniversary of the event is really meaningful um, for all of us, but for me, I just, that for me was like complete serendipitous moment. Um, so for starters, I, I like to actually give people a sense of like, why was I even invited to come here? Or why would you want to listen to me at all? And I guess by the end, you'll tell me whether or not you did. Um, <laughs> so I am born and raised in Denver. Um, I got into gender work, essentially, gender and sexual orientation, uh, not really on purpose. Um, I don't know about most people's career choices, but mine felt a little bit accidental in some ways. And in other ways, I think it was a little predestined. Um, but I essentially, I actually thought I was going to be like an Olympic swimmer and I was just going to like not do anything else. It's like Wheaties box, here I come. Uh, I, I think I actually told my family I was going to make all of my money doing endorsements after, you know, I got done being that Olympian. Um, so shoulders being loose are a real thing and turns out not all of us are Olympic caliber. So plan B, psychology. Um, <laughs> I, I frankly was, um, I was working and coaching like girls swimming and that's basically how I found my way weaving around to wanting to be a therapist. Uh, a lot of people will say to me like, you know, you, you have a kind of a weird job. Like, why, why would you want to listen to people tell you really, really hard stuff all day? I mean, sounds fun, right? It's a good time. Um, I have like the most amazing job, and it is true. I listen to people's hardships sort of day in and day out, but the idea obviously is that somewhere in there there's a change agent. And I don't know about you, but the idea of moving from a really distressing place to something really optimistic, well, that's kind of cool. So in some ways, very accidentally, I find myself, as a clinical psychologist, I just really briefly always like to let people know that I don't really have any conflicts of interest for the purpose of this presentation. But so you have some idea of kind of where I spend my time. Um, I do a lot of work here at home. It's really important to me that I get to speak to my home community. Um, but I also spend some time with the American Psychological Association. So at times in my talk, I may reference things that pertain to the science that has come out of APA. That is not as a representative of APA, but is utilizing some sort of good, just scientific information. Um, so. The title of my talk is Beyond the Borders, From Stonewall to the End of a Gender Regime. So I thought it appropriate to do that ever so classic thing and give you a definition for regime. Basically, I just you know, did the good old Miriam Webster. Um, I think most people, when you say the word regime, you can almost hear it in the word. There's just this sense of something that's uh, confining but strong. Um, pertinent, something you have to pay attention to. I think anytime we use that word, it sort of gets your attention. It's not just like, you know, something that's a construct, which sounds a little more like I got my Legos out and I could build it and take it back apart. A regime has a much different sort of feel to it. I mean, as you can see, here are some nice little definitions. Um, I find it interesting that we have a mode of rule or management, but also things like a period of rule, a form of government, a government in power. I was like, boy, this is a lot of federal references. Um, but basically, the idea that there's some sort of processes that we're following. I find it very interesting that one of the definitions has to do with this orderly procedure of a natural phenomenon or process. So I bring all this to bear because when we're talking about gender and gender identity, this is going to get woven right in. But first, I like to do a little digression in history. Um, so here we are. We're getting close to our 50th anniversary of Stonewall. So this is just to give you, if you've never actually seen an image of Stonewall, the actual inn was obviously not an inn. Nobody was sleeping there, well, not on purpose. Um, <laughs> but the idea was this was this actually very, I'm just going to say it, it was a very dumpy, dumpy bar. It really wasn't really a bar. It didn't have any running water. Okay? Stonewall was just a space where they did serve alcohol, and there was dancing, and generally it was a welcome zone for people that wanted to dance with people of the perceived same gender, or you could wear clothing that may not adapt 
to gender regime rules. Um, and you could do so well, you know, relatively unscathed. Well, this fun tale of Stonewall also has, I mean, honestly, if you've never looked into this, it also has something to do with the mafia. It gets very interesting. It would make a really good reality TV show. Um, but Stonewall, the whole movement came out of these riots. So does anybody know kind of how that got kicked off? Like Stonewall, riots. Well, OK, we're all just hanging out, having some drinks that the mob is supplying. Um, we're paying off the cops so that they don't raid our bar too often and they don't check our IDs too often. But what happened? Yes. Oh, my goodness, surprise. Yeah. So here comes that regime thing, right? So the whole idea was we pay off the police so they don't come too often, but they're going to come just often enough. It was a very nice deal for everybody. Mob gets to sell alcohol. Police get to make some money. Everybody gets to dance. Except there was also this thing called a municipal code that said in New York, you needed to be wearing three pieces of gender appropriate clothing at all times. I know. <laughs> I saw a little head movement and I'm like, yes. That's when we do the like, huh? Um, so there was also this issue, which they would check IDs when they came in. That was one of the raid items, was make sure everybody's of age. Uh, they would sort of look around to see if people were dancing with inappropriate dance partners, meaning people of the same gender or perceived gender. And they would line people up and check the clothing. And if you didn't make muster, you got thrown in the paddy wagon and taken down to the station. So this just kept happening. And as most movements start, somebody got tired of it one day. And the report is through a bottle, through some pennies, through a rock, you take your pick. But somebody threw something. And that invited more people to get involved, and more people. And then it went on for six days of people rioting and gathering. Now, before this ever occurred, there's all kinds of stuff happening from the 1950s and obviously before then. But before this finally hit this sort of just crescendo, there was a lot going on to try to just advance acceptance and equality, especially around sexual orientation. Now, you'll notice I put Stonewall, the birth of the question mark, question mark rights movement. Now, what, what is this marked as? I mean, Stonewall is credited with being the beginning of what rights movement? Yes. I mean, people call it the beginning of the queer rights movement, and it sort of plugs in, sort of plugs in, and sort of failed at the whole transgender part of things. Oh, there's that. Yeah. Yeah, they actually for a long time just said it's the beginning of the gay rights movement. Now, here's what I found really, really fascinating. The more and more I thought about this, was how much of this seemed to have to do with what you were wearing and who you were behaving with, and much less of it had to do with anybody really ostensibly knowing what your sexual orientation might be. It was a lot about behavior, and it was a lot about gender expression. But you're right. The thing that got erased in this when they called it the gay rights movement was all of a sudden gender just seemed to drop out. Now part of what becomes meaningful about this is be before Stonewall, we have two different movements going on. We have one called the Mattachine Society, which is essentially, it was called a homophile organization. And the whole idea was that they wanted to go ahead and assimilate and show respectability, and essentially that gay people were not scary to be among. It was the we're just like you movement. Okay, when you're trying to gain favor with people or make people feel comfortable, being like them is a really good way to go if you want to conform. But what's fascinating is so you've got a whole movement of people that actually gave instructions about dressing in gender conforming ways in order to gain acceptance. The I'm just like you, see, I'm not so scary. There was also a kind of a mirror image movement called the Daughters of Belitis, and that started out of, I believe, out of the San Francisco area. And it started out actually as a social organization, but it was designed for women. So we have this very binary thing going on around gender anyway, and then we have it going on within the movement. Okay. So now we've kicked off this movement with a riot. <laughs> and now we land in what I call alphabet soup land. Anybody starting to get a little lost on how this acronym, like how many letters is in it really? Like, like how many letters shall we have? I mean, what's the longest acronym you can think of? <laughs> By the way, why do we use acronyms? Good little, little social psych lens here for a minute. Why do we use acronyms? I mean, why not just say all the words all the time? Not just this one. Any acronym. Yeah. We would be saying words forever. 
Oh, you just go on and on, right? It's supposed to make it easy. It's supposed to simplify something. We like reductionistic things. It makes it easier to get on with life. So, acronym. Only this one, and this is, by the way, this is not exhaustive, and I know it. This is a slide I've made where I was like, you know what, I think that's enough for right now, but it doesn't give everybody a chance because it doesn't have everything on there because there's more and more and more and more. So LGBT, IQQA, MPOD, ABCDEFG, keep going. I'm sure if we go on long enough, you can fill in the alphabet for me. What's going on here though? Why so many things in one thing that's supposed to make this easier? And why is the G in front sometimes and the L's in front other times? And, and why doesn't the T go first? And how come the B doesn't get a chance? <laughs> and the Q's never in front? Now, there's some obvious things. And this is my overused joke. But if you put B and L and T at the beginning and then follow it with anything, everybody's gone because everyone's on to lunch. And we're lost because associations are real. And we, asso you know, we associate things with other things. And so you can't do that. Although I would claim I don't think the BLT actually laid claim to that space before we had folks who identified in these ways. But why are we just kind of <laughs> building like the ultimate acronym? I mean, I really do want a shirt where it just wraps like, around the shirt. <laughs> and by the way, what else going on in here? I mean, what is this? Like, I've given you like some of the letters. Really quickly, are these all the same concept? And immediately got a pretty emphatic no. <laughs> no, what's happening? We've got gay, lesbian, bisexual. OK, what land are we in? What are, those are examples of what? Sexual orientation. Good job, class. OK. So then all of a sudden we get down. We have transgender, transsexual. Where are we now? Yeah, and I'd even argue in some cases we would call this sex identity as well. And then, let's just, for kicks, keep going. And we get to intersex. We've got queer. We've got questioning. Intersex belongs where? It's usually where things get quiet. <laughs> OK, it's another sex identity. I'm going to be coming back to that. Queer, where do we put queer? Anywhere you want. <laughs> Therein lies the point. OK, and then we've got questioning that could apply to just about anything. Ally, well, I guess it's all the folks that don't fit into these labels, but OK. Uh, multisexual, pansexual, omnisexual. Where, where are we? Demisexual, gray asexual? Does it feel simple yet? <laughs> Is it getting easier? We put it into an acronym, and it makes it fine. This is the number one thing I like to point to for most people is I'm like, if you're ever confused or anybody in your life is confused or this befuddles anyone, it's not your fault. We've made it really complicated. And we put a bunch of things together that may or may not have relation to one another. And I would argue to you they are all conceptually, they have conceptual differences, but they actually do have a relationship. So what to do? Because this can get real confusing real fast. Any words up here that folks are like, mm, not so familiar with that one? Yes? Omnisexual. Omnisexual. So I'm glad we, I've got an honest soul who's like, yes, I've not seen that. I have a feeling there's a lot of you that are like, I don't know what that is either. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Multisexual, pansexual, omnisexual. Most people will kind of consider those like somewhat synonymous, at least in idea. But obviously, if there's three different words for what's supposedly the same thing, they're not the same thing. But the idea being that when we strip away, needing to have sexual orientation predicated on someone's gender, well, all of a sudden, we're in a different realm. For instance, if you have a lesbian person, that is a woman who's attracted to? Say it again. <laughs> Women attracted to who? Women. Women, thank you. There we go. All right. So we got a whole bunch of gender going on. We need to know the gender of the first person, know the gender of the second person. We can put that together, and we get a nice little label out of it. Same thing for gay men, and same thing for bisexual. It's a very binary by two directions. Okay. Once we get to pansexual, we open it up. We basically say, and this is where I really think my idea around this might differ a little bit from what a lot of people will have to say. Folks will say, regardless of gender. I don't think we regardless anything. I think everything ends up being inclusive of. Because frankly, it's part of someone's personhood 
It's part of their self. And if you're interested in that person, my guess is it's because it also includes however they gender themselves. It just may be that your way of thinking of who do I like isn't just predicated on one type of gender or a binary gender or some kind of absolute gender. It kind of opens it up and says, if I like the person, I'm going to like them. But their gender is going to matter to me because it's part of who they are. So I'm not a big regardless fan. So every time I see that, I pretty much do the cross out and write inclusive of. Um, how about, just really quickly, living down here, what are these examples of demisexual and gray A? And furthermore, have people heard these terms? See, I knew people were sneakily sitting there not knowing things and not saying anything. It's OK. We're going to warm right up. So these are actually, this is where we get real technical. Academically speaking, sexual orientation and sexuality, not the same thing. I know we like to use them interchangeably. Sexuality actually has to do with how you do your sexuality, how you do your sexualness, so to speak. Okay, it's less about who you're oriented toward and how you experience that orientation. So if somebody is a fully sexual person, they might like, doesn't matter what time of year it is, doesn't matter like how well they know somebody, they see something pretty walking down the street, they're like, yo, <laughs> that was nice. Only hopefully they don't say that and they don't look like that. And because <laughs> there's this whole thing called like, you know, politeness and manners and being socially appropriate when it matters. Um, if you are somebody who really needs to feel an emotional connection, some sort of emotional tie-in before you really find that you experience any kind of attraction to somebody, you might consider yourself demisexual. That's one definition people will use around demisexuality is that they don't feel like they're just like turned on. I mean, nobody's turned on all the time, but that the switch isn't on full time. But if they get close to somebody, they get to know somebody, they develop an interest, and all of a sudden there's more interest there and so on. Other folks I've had describe things like gray asexual, very much the same as demisexual, but the idea being sometimes I just don't feel sexual at all, and sometimes during different seasons I feel more interested. Now, there's no scientific way to sit down and be like, does it exist? The same way that people, when I used to do LGBTIQA, and I asked everybody what the A was, they used to say ally. Now what do they say? Ace ace. Asexual or ace. Yeah, and, and that used to not be part of the vernacular when I would give a talk like this only maybe 10 years ago. People really routinely didn't have that in mind. And I will tell you, in my field, because we are the field of Freud, people can hiss or react or, but Freud did a few things that were kind of interesting and some other things that were interesting in a bad way. I like the word interesting because it doesn't actually give you a connotation. I just, you know, get to say interesting and then you can figure out whether it's positive or negative. Um, but the idea that people were asexual was actually thrown out. The idea that you had no sexual drive, well, all of like one of Freud's theories would fall apart if that was the case. So we just didn't acknowledge it. So here's the thing. <laughs> if somebody tells me something about their experience, I don't determine that. I'm not their experience police. If somebody tells me they're asexual, they're asexual. If I want to understand that, I spend more time finding out. If somebody tells me that they're gray A, same thing. OK, so in the wonderful world of the acronym, we've now got gender identity, sexual orientation, sexuality, sex identity. We've made it nice and clear. So let's make it even clearer. So I call this Welcome to the Gender Big Top. Um, this is just a small sample of what's happened with gender terminology over time. Um, not exhaustive by any means. And just to really put myself in my truly archaic personality. I was joking earlier, I'm not very tech savvy. I also like to get the Denver Post. Um, like a real paper newspaper. So anybody, want, if you want to feel this later or pass it around, um, feel free. But this one, <laughs> this particular one was out of 2014. And this was when the gender options on Facebook went to 56. So people that are all upset because they're like, there's only two genders. And I'm like, or 56, or keep counting, or just use these ones, or keep sitting tight. Because the proliferation of terminology, this is not going anywhere. And it's not just because people are trying to be like upsetting. It's because human experience is so much more diverse than what we've done to it over time. And so when it really comes right down to it, this sort of rebellion, like the mental rebellion against any kind of expansion in gender, I'm going to tell you, I just think it's human discomfort. 
Just plain old simple, that makes me uncomfortable, I don't like that, it complicates my world and therefore I don't like it, so I will lock down and tell you you can only be one thing or the other. And then I'm going to use other examples to like really back it up, which I'm going to get to in a minute. So anything up here that folks are like, I don't really know what that means. Yes? The BOI term? I actually, I feel like I should start taking like a little clicker poll because that's actually the most popular one that folks are like, what is that? Because when you said it, I mean, you pronounce it, right, boy? A little hint in the word there. <laughs> Except not, you know, you look at it and you're like, well, there's a letter that's different. It sounds similar. What's happening? So I'm going to tell you, anytime I give you a definition, consider that a version of a definition. And by no means is it the be all end all. But the idea here is most of the folks that will identify with the terminology of boy are letting you know that there's something in a masculine kind of realm happening in their gender identity, but not the way you probably think. <laughs> so it's not a cisgender or assigned gender and assigned sex lineup. We're not talking about some kind of congruence between I assigned you a sex as male, I assigned you a gender as boy, B-O-Y, and now it all matches up. That's people turning things on their ear. This is what I love about language. It can be reworked so that it just causes people enough head tilt that maybe they pay a little bit more attention the next time they run into something. Okay, so we've got androgynous, two-spirit, tomboy, transmasculine, sissy, by gender, non-binary, trans, feminine, gender, neutral, gender, fluid, agender, gender, queer. I don't know if I said any of them twice because I probably did. And there's so very, very many more. The reason I refer to it as a big top is just because you think about the commotion of a circus, not in like a, a fanciful way, but the commotion of so many things happening at once. That's the way I think of this. It is simultaneously incredibly exciting and chaotic. And so for folks that are defining their own identity, I think there's a lot of excitement in being able to do that now, especially at this time in history, in a way that you never could before. And actually have some people hear you. Now I say some, because we're still living here. So Ricky Ann Wilchins actually started a uh, movement called Transsexual Menace. So that gives you a flavor of Ricky. Um, nowadays, uh, Ricky actually does a, there's a nonprofit called True Child that's looking at all the ways that gender in a broad way intersects with things like race and ethnicity and different kinds of identity variables and how it sort of hinges people in, but specifically children. So Ricky's gone from being a menace to doing some stuff with kids. <laughs> I really just enjoy the, the way that people's careers shift. But what I loved about this was she wrote a really fabulous book called Read My Lips, uh, Sexual Subversion and the End of Gender. It was a very short little book. It's terribly funny and smart, but it's so poignant. And it was written in 97. But she's the one that first called this a regime. So a binary system predicated on the immutable assumption of a gender regime. Now, the thing I want you to pay particular attention to is that word immutable. Because that's where we're living. It's this whole idea that this is like a real thing, and it can't be upset, and it can't be turned on its ear, and you can't do anything about it. So she referred to these as boxes. You get two of them, you got to go in one, there's nowhere to stand in the middle, you don't choose, and you can't change. I mean, how does that sound to folks? Does that sound fairly accurate to the expectation of society around your gender? Some people are like, yeah, it kind of sucks. <laughs> so I turned this a little bit on its head. But I, I, boxes for me wasn't strong enough. I think of them as cages. And the reason I think of them as cages is I work in the land of human suffering. And a box just didn't feel hard enough to me. Because the, the thing about being like a clinical psychologist working with people who are uncovering who they are and trying to work it out with society as it exists is that it doesn't feel like, oh darn, I'm inside a box. It feels like I'm pressed so tightly against the bars of my cage that it's cutting into me in such a significant way. I cannot live like this. Now I'm going to offer to you, it's not just folks that might be transgender, non-binary, folks that are gender expansive that feel like they're in a cage, we're all in a cage. Because this regime doesn't just apply to some people, it applies to everyone. But most people, if you're standing in the middle of your cage, you probably don't notice your bars. You got room to move around, 
You're like, look, and I can go over here, and I can put on some gender expressive clothing, and I can, but my gender conformity in general just loves, lets me get along in the middle. If you don't fit neatly in your cage, and you're trying desperately to get out, it's going to hurt. So I call this sociocultural categorization, or AKA regulated homogeneity. Fancy words for we want to make it all the same and then have you keep it that way, that makes me comfy. Okay, so real quickly, how do I know your gender? If I just start looking at you out in this fine audience while I take a swig of water, how would I know anything about your gender? Pattern matching. Yeah. Okay. They have without any conscious thought. So you're talking about like pattern matching. You're not just talking like I wore plaid today. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and I put it with a solid. You're talking about like I'm patterning to the regime and I'm not even paying attention. I just got up and went, went to town. Okay. And it's about so much more than your clothing, right? Yes. Ask. What's that? Ask. Ask. Well, that would be the most, <laughs> the most appropriate way. Thank you for using your higher order thinking. So now what I'm going to invite you to do, and I'll invite you to do this a few times, I want you to use your like non-higher order thinking. I want you to use the brain that just like spits crap at you all day, snap judgments, first impressions. That's what I want you to tell me about. Hair length, Hair length right? It's a popular one. Like, change it up a little bit and all of a sudden I'm going to be reading the gender. Yeah. What else? How would I know anything about your gender? Clothing. Clothing. Yeah, your clothing's a big part of this code. I'm going to spend a lot of time on that. Why? It's so visible. It's very helpful and handy for me. <laughs> it's also more appropriate than what most people think that we should do to get people's gender nailed down, which tends to be a referential to your sex. Not appropriate for me to try to guess at that right off the bat, or do I do that also? So I really quickly, this is a little term I came up with, it's called gender currency. I figured over time, I tried to think of things, different ways to conceptualize, like what is it we're doing when we're reading people? Because that's what we do, right? We read gender, we read personality, we read threat. This is all called bias, by the way. It all fits under the exact same header. It's our implicit bias, and it's sometimes it's our explicit bias. And by the way, it's not your fault. Your brain does this automatically, and it will keep doing it. But there's a few things about gender currency that I find expressly important. One, things carry disparate value. So we mentioned, like, hair length. OK, so how quickly is that going to get screwed up, right? I mean, let's say for a minute we gave you a trim. Don't worry. This is not going to be like a little you know, live theater action. But we just took a little off and you know, made it a little shorter, maybe a little something more like my do. What have we done? Have we, have we upended your whole gender? No. no. Some, people might think that. Some people might. Or what other assumptions might they make about you? Anyone want to take a stab at this one? Right. There you go. Yeah, I'm going to take a nice trip from gender land to sexual orientation land like that. It's like a TGV, like whew. OK. They have disparate value. Uh, how can I explain that? Let's see here. There's also this nice agreement among those in power. So you always have to have that, right? To have a good regime, you got to have powerful people agreeing to something. But what are the kinds of cues and markers that tend to be really strong cues and markers to tell us what gender a person may be? And again, I want you to go with what I call your vomit up brain, not your like, I know how to think about this in a culturally competent fashion. Pitch of voice. OK, well, why would that be one? Sometimes you hear just the way you know, women tend to have a higher pitch than men. OK. So there's actually some like biology behind sex differentiation with that, because certain hormones create deeper vocal ranges. However, we always have a bell curve, right? We got people on the higher and lower end of everything. And what if, I mean, what if I'm just rocking like a baritone out here? I'm probably not a good example, actually. But let's say we got somebody with a nice full beard with an incredibly high-pitched voice. How are you going to read their gender? Just imagine to yourself really quickly what you think you would think. Not your higher order brain. Again, full facial hair. 
that's a masculine signal. I can put a full beard in the most feminine attire. I can have that person strutting like nobody's, just really lovely, just nice movement, very, just we can fem it up. That beard is not gonna let you let it go. It has high currency, okay? There are certain things that we just read higher than others. So just for kicks, because I like to just really, you know, make myself, uh, I like to put myself out for some good embarrassment and flogging. I'm just going to let you go ahead and tell me about my gender, since I was already guessing about yours. Please, what is my gender? Shall we go easier? <clears throat> How about my sexual orientation? Let's just take all the things and mash them together. Let me know if you need any particular movements from me. Uh, and I mean, if I need to list my activities. I think it's cheating if we met your partner. Well, there is that. I might have brought somebody with me. <laughs> but you don't know anything about that person either, so let's just have some fun. OK, so if somebody was not cheating. <laughs> I really want someone who just like, you know, first of all, doesn't know me already. There's a couple people I actually know. Uh, somebody who just like walked in the room or saw my picture and was like, boom, brain was like, Bleh. oh, come on. I know every last one of you had a thought. It's because our strengths were psychic. No, I'm kidding. Or am I? I'm just gonna, I'm really good with uncomfortable silence, yeah. I guess I would, because you remind me of my sibling, I would go with gender non-binary. Okay, um, because I remind you of somebody that yeah. you know. Like you're fitting that archetype. Okay. More than either. Okay, you're like non-binary archetype. Because, well, but there's a very important piece that you said there, which is because my sibling, you remind me of my sibling. Mm -hmm. Okay, nice little brain factor here, right? Our brain's like, well, let's put things together. Makes life a little simpler. Okay, non-binary. Yes. I would say you're probably, you might identify as female, but probably butch. Okay, female but butch. Now, really quickly, I like to make myself uncomfortable and you. Um, <laughs> what, <laughs> what about me gave you female? Uh, Feel free. This is usually where I just start doing a little <laughs> casual undressing for you. Yes. Oh, there's that. Yeah. If I actually introduce myself and give you she and her, and I'm just like rocking off the she and her, you might be like, okay. Anything else? Yeah. Your chest. Oh, my gosh. Oh, God, how'd you notice that? I mean, actually, how did you notice that? No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> yeah, so there's this secondary sex characteristic thing, right? There is this thing that actually gives tip offs about bodies, and we like to make bodies into genders. Okay, but what else? I mean, you know, keep it going. Now, let's go back to my sexual orientation for a minute. We'll leave the land of gender behind. Again, I'm not looking for really sophisticated thinking, and I'm not looking for you to be culturally competent. I want you to just tell me what your brain absolutely barfs up when you look at me. I'm gay. gay. Anyone else? Who's for gay? Lesbian. lesbian. How about let's put them both together? <laughs> gay or lesbian? Can I just show of hands there? Okay, okay. Any other takers? Yes. Queer. Queer. Okay, well, yeah, we could just let me. <laughs> All right, for those who didn't actually like, meet my girlfriend on the way in, <laughs> what made you say that? Don't just social stereotypes of like what's in the media? Mm. Sure, well, what is in the media? Well, like you, tend, like, you tend to see women who have like short hair dressed mm -hmm. like more traditionally masculine clothing. You know, like, not wearing a lot of cosmetics, flat shoes. Um. <laughs> so, like, it's all happening. <laughs> it is. I've even gotten takers before on lesbian hair. Like, you have lesbian hair. I was like, huh. That's very interesting. I had no idea she had her own thing going up there. OK. There are some things that obviously, and the reason why I berate this is because I'm like, this is real. This is what happens all day, every day, all day long. Okay, whether it's accurate or not, this is exactly what goes on. This is what your brain is designed to do. This is what everybody else's brain is designed to do. It just so happens we do have more capability than that. And whether or not we use that capability is the whole issue. 
So ding, 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 if you guessed I was gay or lesbian, and I mean, queer actually works for me too, you're a big winner. So here's the downside of this whole deal is your stereotype totally worked. You know what that means? You're liable to use it again. That's called reinforcement. I win! So you're like, good system, I'll use it again. And it will get wrong sooner or later because that's what happens. Now the other part of this was you had to read something about my physicality if you want to get my sex identity. It's like you keep going now, but the problem is that bodies look a lot of different ways. I'm just giving you currency cues. I'm giving you the thing that you mentioned. Every morning, everybody gets up and adorns themselves in some way, carries themselves in some way, represents themselves in some way, and the way they do that has different meaning to other people depending on where they're from, who they know, how they associate things. Gender exists as a construct worldwide. It just doesn't exist in exactly the same lens. There's differences among the genders around the world Femininity, masculinity, or something else, or combinations get read differently. So very simply put, these things are not the same. I like that just as its own slide because if there's one thing, anytime I ever do a presentation, if I could just get one thing across people, I'd be like, just this, just this, not the same thing. Here's the problem, back to the regime. This is how we do things. We basically say, let's take something we consider biological, which is sex. We think of it as a biologic kind of phenomenon. You have certain chromosomes, you have certain hormones in your body that turn on or don't turn on, and you have bits. I wish I had come up with that. That was a college student. I don't have a way to give a citation. But I rather liked it, because I said something, and they were like, you know, you're bits. And I was like, right. OK, so that's why we get a tribute to the nuts and the bolts. So what are we really talking about? We essentialize people's bodies, <clears throat> and then we decide who everybody's gender is according to body parts. Because frankly, folks, right now I'm going to ask you, how many of you happen to know your unique chromosomes? You got your chromosomes down? <laughs> is there like a little card in your pocket, a little record of your chromosomes? It's funny, because the, but I'm just going to imagine for a moment here, most of you probably don't know exactly what your chromosomes are. Some of you might know your relative hormone levels. And most of you know your bits. We don't have the full picture. How do you even know what sex you are? So then what happens? So then we have this thing called sex, and we like to assign gender based on sex. And so here's the deal. Gender is not that simple. <laughs> it's made up of multiple components. So we have. This whole social construct idea, which people are very fond of, when you, when you say gender, especially, I mean, I went to a liberal arts college, and you talk about gender, people are like, you know, it's a social construction, and then we got all deconstructionists and talked about Jacques Derrida, and, you know, mired ourselves in literature, and just having the privilege to sit on your, your butt and philosophize. But the reality is, there is this social category, and it's relative, depending where you live, the culture in which you grow up, but there's also an internal sense of self, which is your gender identity. That's not up for grabs. That's something only you're going to know. That's something only you piece together. But we don't do this in a vacuum. And so there's this thing called gender expression, which we give to the world, our gender currency. And we do it all within that sort of socially, culturally relative place. So really, if I had to put the full gendered self, it exists right in that intersection of this lovely little Venn diagram. It's a very, very finite little space where we actually feel completely whole. Because most of the time, people are trying really hard to figure out how to navigate this while this is happening and what to do with that. So why have a regime at all? This is a, a fun little picture. I don't know if anybody recognizes. This is a nice little instruction manual from Legos. Anybody recognize the character from Legos? What kind of Legos are these? They don't have the classic little yellow head. Nobody's been playing Legos lately? They're Lego friends. That's right. And what are Lego friends? I like how neatly you put that. Most people are like, girl Legos. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's uh, there's more definition in the characters' bodies and facial expressions and more kinds of hair and there's a lot of pink and purple and teal blocks to build with. Um, so this brings up this. We have this regime, this thing that really doesn't work, okay? I'm going to offer you, it doesn't work or else we wouldn't have the alphabet happening in the acronym. So what's the goal? Why have a regime at all? Furthermore, if we're no longer focused on like the bare necessity of survival, then what's the utility in having such reductionistic thinking? Yes? Control what helps the people currently in power maintain current power. Okay, well there's that, right? There's the whole power thing. Like I'd like to stay here and feel comfy in my nice little cushy power binary gender place. I mean, when you really ask people about like why does this even matter, give me some reasons why gender even matters. Why do we, why do we need a system of gender? Do we need a system of gender? Yes? So as a proxy, age, right? Um, when I was a kid, I had no idea what someone's age was, right? Yeah. And I treat everyone kind of the same. I feel like I've probably gotten a lot better at guessing someone's age. And if I know someone is in their 70s, I'm going to hold the door for them. Uh-huh. I might not hold them, but I certainly won't hold them if they're in their 20s. Right? OK. <laughs> yeah. You're like, I'm, I'm code switching, depending yeah. on. Age. Now, I'm not saying that that's an ex directly translates to gender, but you do treat people differently, and they expect most people expect different be behavior from you based on their gender. Sure, I mean, sure. Like, I, I mean, I can give no better example, honestly, about kind of our obsessiveness around this categorization than um, anybody here have a dog? Yeah, a few dog lovers in the room. When you're out walking your dog, and somebody thinks your dog is the cutest dog they've ever seen, that's how I used to feel. They get down and they go, oh my god, what a cute little dog. What is it? Why do you need to know the sex, namely, of the dog? And furthermore, they don't ask for the sex. They don't say, what sex is it? They say, what is it? And then somebody answers with a nice, it's a boy or a girl. I have a dog. Which doesn't have to do with that power thing anymore. Unless we're feeling threatened by the canine universe, they are organizing. <laughs> yes? Uh, should I know how to refer to the dog? Oh, yes, because I'd hate to offend the dog. <laughs> <laughs> our, our, our translatable language is so similar. Yes. <laughs> you don't want to assume all the dogs are boys or right. all the dogs are females. Right. Well, and if you get it wrong, what does the owner do? Is that, like if you say, oh, she's so cute, and they're like, oh, yeah, he's, he's, he's precious. Yeah. <laughs> he's really adorable, isn't he? I mean, is anybody else struck by that? I mean, it happens every day. Like, if you're a dog person, you're like, oh my goodness, here we go again. And you do it. And here I am, supposed to be all like gender competent, and I'm like, no, no, she, blah, 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 blah. Before I even think about it, to your point, it is automatic. What gives? The reason I bring up evolution <laughs> is because typically when I'm talking to folks about gender just as a phenomenon, people are like, well, I mean, how would you know? Who to pair with if you can't tell what people are, you know, like, okay, so now we're on to the symbolism of gender as relationship to the physical body because if you don't know that, what happens? You might just see somebody super attractive and be like, damn, wait a minute, wait a minute. If I don't know what gender they are, now my world is in disarray. How do I think of myself? Okay, we're, we're a culture that has moved so far beyond needing sort of basic, especially in this country, basic sort of fundamental needs met, that we evolve to worry about things that are really quite interesting. So I bring up Castor Semenya, a South African sprinter, because this is actually, ironically, even though her bibs is 2009, there's still appeals going on because Castor was just blowing records out of the water especially in things like 800 meters, I mean, just killing it. But people said, she looks mannish. So I always find it interesting because then we have this U Magazine and we really dolled Castor up for this one. Folks, Castor has higher testosterone levels than an average female person. So they put a ruling in place that said you needed to chemically bring her levels down to compete in the female category. And it's being appealed because people are like, but this, that's the body she was born with. 
Now, there's all kinds of uproar around, is Castor indeed somebody who might be considered intersex or have a difference of sex development, meaning having a difference of sex development where her body is not prototypically the way we think of female bodies because, you know, female bodies have a certain amount of testosterone, a certain amount of estrogen, and so on. But it's body regulation. But if we don't do that in sport, what happens to sport? I like simple questions like that just to have you kind of thinking. <laughs> just really easy to solve. The bottom line is there are some practical applications of all of this that go beyond things like partnering, because people often will go there. I have to know the gender of the person to know if I like them or not. I'm like, I don't know if that's really true. But things like sport, which we created, we have a whole system of competition that falls apart if you can't figure out what categories to put people in. Are you going to put people in the, these folks compete in the testosterone from this level and above, but you have these chromosomes and you have, I don't know that people are going to do that. But is it right to tell somebody you need to modify your physicality to compete? I don't know if that's okay either. So a lot of what this gets into obviously is the conflation of sex and gender and the problematic thinking that surrounds that. So the other part I kind of want to bring some attention to is when it comes to gender identity, that's what, you know, we do this assignment thing and we do it right away, right? We do it right when somebody, not even when they're born, right? We do this when they're in utero. We go, you're having a, or do you want to know the, we say, do you want to know the sex of the baby? And then what gets told? It's usually not female and male, folks. It's usually a gender notation. You're having a boy, you're having a girl, which comes with all kinds of trappings, all kinds of expectations of treating people differently, even when they're not here yet. So why is all of this causing such a big hubbub? Well, it's because gender is not something the way science is looking at this now is gender is something that's on board already. We don't see it as a social construction, just social variable, something that you somehow rear. It's something, I think of it as gender archaeology. It's something you're uncovering. People uncover this at different rates. You can think of this in terms of if somebody grows up in a culture where exploring your gender and really getting a feel for that and not doing it in the confines of a binary was absolutely an option and was promoted, it's like coming along with like a sandblaster gun and just blowing the sand right off of it. You might get to what feels like is authentically there a lot faster than if you grow up in a culture where people are constantly gender regulating and telling you who you are, who you're supposed to be. You might be sitting there desperately dusting off and then people just come along and they keep kicking the dirt back on. And you're dusting off again and they're kicking it back on. And so when people are confused as to why people just don't know automatically from the time that each one of us is 18 months to two years, which is what people assume is the case for like cross-gender identified children, there's only a small subset of children that actually are like verifiably, whether they're cisgender, that congruence of sex and gender as assigned, or they're somebody that has some gender expansiveness, gender variance. Most folks don't know at 18 months to two years exactly who they are. They're figuring it out though, and this evolves over the lifespan. So if you don't believe that this is a thing, I'm going to go rapid fire through cover after cover of magazines that are not just, you know, kind of insider community magazines, but National Geographic, Time, <laughs> this is Laverne Cox. These ones, Men's Health, this is the ultimate man competition, and this is Aiden Dowling, and every time somebody brings up something about bathroom bills or we try to regulate in space who should go into what bathroom, and they find out that Aiden Dowling has XX chromosomes and was assigned female at birth, and I ask them, if Aiden was in your bathroom in the ladies' room, would you feel like that made a lot of sense to you because that's what you're advocating for? I'm just checking before we gender regulate, and don't get me started about restrooms, but I'm going to do that in a minute anyway. <laughs> Here's one that puts people kind of back in history. 1976, we have Bruce Jenner. Bruce was like the poster person of masculinity. <clears throat> and then she came out as Caitlyn. The reason why to me this is more important, I don't care whether you like Caitlyn Jenner or not. I mean, Caitlyn might care, she might not care. It's that all of a sudden it brought this so much to the forefront for a lot of people because generationally, people knew who Bruce Jenner was. Bruce Jenner was everybody's Olympic darling. So what it did is it all of a sudden threw people into an awareness level that they didn't have before. The thing I find really interesting, of course, is this is not new. 
There is nothing new about gender expansive identities and non-binary identities, nothing at all. These are just examples from around the world of cultures that have had language for third genders or for genders that exist outside the binary for a very long time. Um, that term in the first one, you'll run into it, Berdash. It's not considered a term that you want to go using. Um, and there's not a universal term for all native populations in North America. A lot of people will hear two-spirit used in that fashion. Two-spirit came around in about the 1990s. It is used among some tribes to kind of encapsulate those folks that might embody more gender than just binary gender. And I say that very purposefully. It's not just about combinations of masculinity and femininity. So <laughs> how do we make sense of all this then when we have this two-party system? And I like to really quickly, this is my niece, by the way. So I just like to point out that we got born. And then real quick, we had to make sure we got the right cap on there, because heaven forbid you mix that one up. Pink and blue. When did this come around? Yeah. Well, it, at first it was the other way around, mm -hmm. like in the 19th century, and it kind of got switched. Yeah, so we didn't actually get the current template until about 1940. And before that, you're absolutely correct. Pink was considered appropriate for boys and blue for girls because blue was delicate and dainty and pink was strong. Yes? Wasn't it also a marketing thing to make it so they couldn't as easily, they had to buy more clothes for kids because you couldn't pass it down as easily from siblings? That's absolutely correct. It's commercialism and marketing. By the way, marketing is I think, the proudest area of social psychology, only social psychology has absolutely divorced itself from marketing. But marketing pretty much just uses social psychology as a science and then just, just spreads it out all over everybody. So just really quickly, in case you don't think that this is still a really strong thing, these are baby gender reveal options. My favorite, personal favorite, is the gender reveal volcano. <laughs> and I do like the he or she's. I thought that person was explicitly clever. And then I do like how many things explode when you smack them. <laughs> okay. So basic premise here. <laughs> we start gendering from before people even show up on the earth. So if people think this is just something that we kind of do, kind of, sort of, no, we do this first. This is a bigger, more central item than just about any other aspect of identity. It is more pervasive, and it is strangles people in their options. So I'm going to have to whip through some material here because I know that I'm going on and on and on. But I need to actually mention this because this is an incredibly important case. That whole idea that gender was reared was very popular, so popular that science said that's absolutely what happens. So popular that when there was a botched circumcision on identical twin males in Winnipeg, they told the parents, don't worry, the child whose penis was ablated, you can just raise as a female. And when the time comes, we'll give cross-sex hormones and don't tell the children, because that wouldn't be good, but everything will be fine. Um, everything was not fine. <laughs> So at some point, in this case, it was Brenda. Um, it was called John Joan case, but Brenda was her name at the time. But more appropriately, David Reimer never felt like a girl. And so this all went on and on and on. And lots of seedy details with John Money and studying these identical twins, because this was a gimme case. Identical twins is the perfect control. It failed miserably. Once David Reimer figured out that he had been assigned male at birth, he immediately, to the best of his ability, transitioned to living as a man. Both siblings ended up taking their lives. So it failed, and it failed to grade a plum so much that that's the one time a sample size n of 1 is completely appropriate to decide you don't need any more information. So earlier, I, I was alluding to the fact that I was walking around saying, guess my gender identity, guess my sexual orientation. It's because we have a bad habit of putting them together. And we have a bad habit because it's the way our brains work. It's an associative kind of network. Um, I did find these at Target, and I just wanted to be sure you knew that's the girl hat, the boy hat, and that's actually the boy hat also in gender neutral green. So if there's another piece that I think is probably really helpful to understand about gender is the fact that there's this gender web. This idea that gender is internal, but it is influenced by your nature. It's actually influenced by your assigned sex, by how you are raised and in what culture you are raised, and then what happens over the developmental lifespan. 
Okay, so it's not something as, as simple as 18 months to two years, I make a declaration of who I am, unless that's just kind of the way that occurs to me, but more so that this is something people are figuring out over time, and the regime is the thing that kind of keeps people stuck in these lanes. And it's, to be honest with you, it's part of what's delayed a lot of people being able to come to their authentic gender and actually disclose or make sense of that with other people. So I always like to leave you with an exercise, which is, how do you know your gender? It's to be able to give yourself some thought and think about how on earth do I know it? Because I guarantee you, all of you know your gender. You know something about it. The question is, how do you come to that awareness? What sense do you make of that? Because there's plenty of things <laughs> that are going to instruct you as to how it exists. This is what I call our scientific method. We observe sex, we assign gender, we nurture and culturalize you, and we expect a cisgender outcome except for gender variance exists, and it always has, across culture, across ages, around the world. So my final sort of parting thoughts are going to land on bathrooms. <laughs> um, my, my favorite there is the use and repurposing of a urinal. Um, birds of paradise make a really nice transitional object when you want to switch it up. Um, I'm a big function person, so I like these images because, frankly, these are, to me, functional images when people, things are actually telling you things that are useful, like, you know, one person per bathroom stall is a useful instruction. Um, you should drive slow because there's children in the alley petting animals. <laughs> I still haven't seen those animals. This is my grandmother's farm in West Texas. I'm still on the lookout. <laughs> but we live in a land of really using reductionistic thinking to keep things simple, but the problem is it's actually caused more complication. That proliferation of acronym, all those letters, they're important because it gives people freedom to decide who they are and tell you about it. What it's not functional in is trying to take all of that and boil it down to some simplistic way of thinking about human diversity. At the end of the day, this is just to remind you that like children, adolescents, there's important things that go on in our lives that basically kind of hedge us in making relationships, trying to get love from people, reinforcement, wanting to make sure my parents take care of me, all of this matters. These are functional items. They run smack into identity components simply because you're trying to make sure the you you show people actually gets reflected back to you and that it's accepted and loved. So to just really put myself on the funeral pyre one more time, this is me because there's a reason I'm in this work, folks. <laughs> I come to gender variance very naturally. My image, there in the corner, that's a Miss Piggy embroidered sweatshirt. My facial expression says it all. But even I went through a very nice period of trying to work it out. Conformity doesn't mean the inside changes. It means I learned the rules and I tried to play along. And in my case, the cage bars weren't so, so tight. I could live life as a female. I could understand myself as a woman, but only the way I understood myself. And over time, you make your own room. This is the parting thought I'd like to leave with you the most. Diversity is the rule, not the exception. The weird thing about it is our biology is programmed to reductionistically think about things because you're just trying to get through your day. If you can't make sense of things in a snap judgment, you would be hung up in the grocery aisle trying to pick a kind of ketchup. There's like 16 different ketchups. And if you examined each and every one with just as much uniqueness as it deserved, you'd be there all day. Now, human beings are not ketchup, which is why I make this standard remark that go ahead and use your reductionistic thinking where it makes sense. But please don't do it where it doesn't. We actually have more capability to use our brains in much, much more expansive ways than we give ourselves credit for. So everybody likes a good Rita Mae Brown. I think the reward for conformity is that everyone likes you except yourself. Basic idea, <laughs> be weird. Be weird, <laughs> be it visibly, live it out. You're going to give people the opportunity to really get to know the fact that human diversity is a beautiful thing, is something to celebrate, it's real, that gender expansiveness is the rule, not the exception. And with that, I'm actually going to tie that up and see if there are any questions.
Oh, and applause.